it's very important for us to, to be praying. I found myself this afternoon, uh, I found myself this afternoon in a place I have never been before, physically. I've never been in this place before. It's like a new place to be. Uh, I found myself on the roof of this building it was a couple hours ago. And uh, the, the, yeah, the, uh, I don't have a fear of heights. It's not the heights, it's the hitting the ground. That's the part that scares me. The falling is not the issue, it's the hitting the ground. But, um, so we've had, thankfully you haven't noticed it in here and the Lord is just so good, but the hornets have decided to take up residence and make nests in a way, place that we don't normally see, which is on that side of the building. And so they found a little spot to work their way into our building. So we've been killing hornets here. Mike can tell you, he had like, it was like 11 to, 11 to zero, because you're still alive. Yeah, it's not 11 to one, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So it's 11 to zero. Uh, so he's up there, he was up there in the radio booth like la- last Wednesday with the vacuum, like sucking him out of the sky while working the radio. I mean, it's amazing, like the stuff that goes on. And then yesterday I opened up our storage room, which is next to the radio room, and I was just, the ground was moving uh, because there was like 30 or more of these hornets on the ground, and it was dark until I turned the light on. And then all of a sudden they're all, I was like, okay, lights back off, vacuum. And so today was the mission. I was like, all right, I already sprayed one of their nests a couple days ago, and that's done, but there's another one. So that one required me to get up on the roof. And so got up there. And the hornets, it's fine. Hornets are taken care of. I'm sure that that, that issue is not the issue. But what I noticed up there, I've never been on the roof of this building. It's a pretty awesome view from up there. Like you can see the bay. Um, as you're looking to the south there, you can see the bay. And I mean, you can see like the, the, the playhouse and other things that are down there and uh, further down in Arcata there. You look over and you can see, you know, Neeland and see the mountains up over there. And you're just like, wow, that's awesome. You start to look to the north. It was really cool. I actually spent a few minutes up there. I mean, I was, after I was done doing what I was up there for, I, I was just up there just enjoying that perspective. And, you know, it was just a moment there. The Lord's like, well, just why don't you spend some time with me right now? I'm like, all right, I'm not going to close my eyes, though, Lord, if that's okay, <laughs> you know? And uh, just, just chatting with the Lord, just uh, conversation. He brought some things to mind, and it was just one of those moments where it's like, no, now, now stop. So I this thing I'm doing, and then I'm, I'm teaching, or I'm doing something for you this evening, so I really don't have time to, cause that was not the, that's not the right answer. And the Lord's like, hey, I'm talking to you. Stop. Let's have a conversation. Like, I want to talk to you. And it can happen at any time. Today we're talking about prayer. We're talking about this conversation that we have with the Lord. This, it's two ways, too. It's not just us talking to Him. It's us talking to Him, Him speaking to us, and it's a back and forth. And it's so encouraging. And it can happen at a time that you don't expect. And the Lord's just like, now is the time. You know, it's one of those things where it's, I don't have time to pray. I would have to tell you that you don't have time not to pray. You don't have the time not to pray. If you feel so rushed, like I've got to make this decision without praying, let me just tell you, that is a warning sign right there. If you find yourself going, I have to make this decision right now, I don't have time to pray. Not true. You always have time to pray. It may be a short prayer. We talked about a short prayer on Sunday, right? Peter, drowning, going under the waves, sinking. Help! As a prayer. A heartfelt, like, sincere to God prayer. So, yeah, sometimes you don't have time for a longer prayer. That's understandable at times, yes. But we always have time to pray. Always have time to pray. Think about those times that you regretted not praying. You know, make a decision. You find yourself in in a... in a place, and you just go, oh, I made a decision, I did something, I really wish I would prayed before I got myself into this. So tonight, we're going to talk about prayer, and um, let me say one more thing about prayer. This is really important. I mean, we've got so much to talk about prayer. i got like five pages of notes. Sunday, I had two. Today, I have five. It's a lot of quotes. I'll just be reading a lot of quotes here, but, but this is something I need to say that's not in my notes, and I think it's really important, especially for all of you dear overthinkers right here, okay, and are listening. You know who you are. You know who you are. Thinking is not praying. Let me say that again. Thinking is not praying. Thinking is you relying on your own resources, what you know, what you remember. Praying is going beyond your limited and meager resources and going to God and going, Lord, I need your help. I, need to come. I-, I want to talk to you. You're going beyond the limitations of who you are. Remember, praying and thinking are not the same. And sometimes what we do is, I really thought about that. You thought about it. Did you pray? 
Well, I thought about it. Mm -mm, Not the same. Not the same. So church, how about this? It doesn't mean you don't think, but you definitely should pray. And I would even say this. I think Jim told me this. You know what? You, You should pray first before you think. And doesn't that go against who we are as people? No, I need to think first. Really? Really? You're going to use the person with less resources first before you go to God? Nah, it doesn't make sense. We should pray before we think. It doesn't mean you don't think. Please don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean you, don't, you shut your brain off and you don't think. No, but you should go to God first and go, Lord, guide my thoughts. Help me. Help me. So I'm going to pray that for myself tonight. And would you agree with me in prayer? as we start out. Papa, thank you so much as we come before you tonight. Thank you for bringing the family together on this beautiful night. It appears that a storm is rolling in. And Lord, as storms come and storms go, you remain. Tonight I ask for your resources. I have a limitation and an end, and it's going to come very quick. Uh, But Lord, you have no limit and no end. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, all-sufficient. It's from those resources that I ask this evening, Papa, that you would fill me up and that you would speak this evening. And for each one of us, that we would hear what we need to hear, not necessarily what we want to hear, but what we need to hear for where we are right now in our lives. We love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 Okay, some real quick basics about prayer. Some basics about prayer. Who can pray? Everyone. Everyone can pray. Everyone can pray. Prayer does not require speaking, although we typically will say, well, prayer is involved speaking. But you know it, especially if you're married, you understand that you can communicate without even saying a word. A look could be a positive thing or a negative thing. Volumes of words don't, aren't necessary with just one look, where it's like, oh, got it. You know you've done something right or you've done something wrong, even just by a look. And sometimes with the Lord, he impresses something upon you without any words. It's something that bypasses even your hearing, and it goes right to your spirit. And there's times where you don't have the words, and so you just go, oh, you just kind of groan. You're just heavy in your heart about something. That's so awesome because the Holy Spirit can interpret that groaning. And God goes, I got you. I understand what you mean. I was like, I don't know the words. God's like, you don't need words. I know where you are. But cry out to me. So who can pray? Everyone can pray. Everybody can have a conversation with the Lord. Even (laughs) non-believers? Even sinners? Yes, because if sinners couldn't pray to God, then none of us could pray to God. And if non-believers couldn't pray to God, then no one could ever be saved. Think about it. Somebody who's not saved, who's not a Christian, God, I'd like to be, sorry, I'm not talking to you. (laughs) I'm not listening to you. You're not a believer. Yes, God does listen to unbelievers. If you're a Christian, then he listened to you when you were an unbeliever, when you called out to him, when you cried out to him. Even at times where you were just, you didn't have a relationship with the Lord, but you were just mad at him and angry at him, he still heard you. He still heard you. And you know what? He even went beyond the words that you said, and he understood your hurting heart. He understood the pain that you were feeling. He had compassion upon you. Prayer is awesome. It's two-way. Okay, who can pray? Everyone. What is prayer? It's a direct line to God. You have your own direct line. I mean, okay, so we don't live in that day and age now, but back in the 80s, as I was growing up, you know, I always heard about the red phone, right? The phone that's like, or whatever, I don't know what the color of the phone is, but there's this phone in the president's office, at least back then in the 80s, and it was like a direct line to the, you know, the, the president or the premier or whoever of, of Russia, of the USSR, And it was the idea of like that phone rings, you pick up the phone or you can make a direct call and and it was for the important phone calls. Well, you have a direct line to God. It's not a corded phone. It's not even a cell phone. It bypasses all that technology. You don't have to worry about your battery being dead. You don't have to worry about reception. It's perfect reception and you have it. So you can go right to God. You can call out to God and just say, God, this is what I need. This is where I'm at. God, I want to thank you for something that you've done. It doesn't always have to be what you need. It could be even just letting the Lord know how, how amazing he is. But as a pastor, I have to tell you, there's a lot of people that, are <laughs> that will come in my direction over the years and be like, hey, um, like, I need you to like, pray for me on this one. Sure, and usually when I'm praying with somebody, I'll say, how can I pray with you? I don't say, how can I pray for you as much? I do sometimes, but what I really mean is, how can I pray with you? What does that do? It encourages the person to also be praying. 
so that it's not like, hey, I went to the pastor, and I was like, listen, this is my prayer. <laughs> Here you go. Great. You give that to God, and I'm, I'm good. That's not how prayer works either. Yes, I will pray with you, but my hope is, as I say with you, is that you also are praying to God. You're actually asking him on your behalf. Because sometimes people think, well, the pastor has the more direct line to God. No, sorry, my line is just as direct as your line. And you can go right to God. You know what that also means? Somebody can come to you with something and you can go, I'll pray. You, work that into your vocabulary. Hey, I'll pray with you about this. Because you're not called to carry everything that people have, but you are called to do something with it, which is to lift it up to God, to pray to God and go, Lord, my dear friend, this person that I just met, they have this issue, I want to lift them up to you. God, would you please minister to them and would you lead them and guide them? Where can you pray? So awesome. Anywhere, even the roof of the building. When can you pray? Anytime. Anytime. Sometimes what God will do is, sometimes what God will do is he will allow sleep to escape you because there's actually something more important than sleep that you need because you need to talk to him and he has something to tell you. And so I encourage you, rather than be frustrated by why you're not sleeping, I get it, that can be frustrating, just go, wait, maybe God is trying to tell me something. Maybe God, Lord, what is it that you want? Why, what's going on? Let him wake you up in the night. Let him do those things. And if he gives you a little bit of insomnia, he's giving you a little bit more time to speak with him and pray with him. So anytime, it can happen anytime. Um, why should we pray? Because God calls us to do that. He instructs us to do that. He, because he wants to converse with us. He wants to. And so that's why we should want to. Because God, who we say as Christians, we put our faith in, he wants to talk to us. How much that would hurt if it's, hey, how are you doing? I'd love to talk to you. Have you ever talked to somebody on the phone or even in person and you could tell like they're, they don't want to talk to you? And they're doing everything that they can do to put a period at the end of the conversation? Yeah, well, okay, well, that's great, that's good. Oh, listen, I totally have to go uh, take care of something. <laughs> what do you have to take care of? Something super important. I gotta leave right now. And you just go, you can just tell they don't want to talk to you. I, 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 it ashames me to think of the number of times I've done that to the Lord. Hey, Jim, I really want to talk to you. Yeah, God, I get it. Mm, I'm just super busy doing some other stuff. God has feelings too. And you think about how much that hurts you when you can tell somebody doesn't want to talk to you. Maybe for you, if you're a parent, it's your kids. And they're like, yeah, mom. Yeah, dad. And you're just like, I just want to talk to you. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm just going, oh. I wonder how many times the Lord has to deal with that. Not with you guys, because you, you know that about yourself. I just mean about me. Where God's like, Jim, I really want to talk to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm so busy doing stuff for you, God. I don't have time right now. We, we always have the time to pray. So there's lots of ways to look at prayer, lots of like acronym ways to think about prayer to make, maybe help us remember some important parts about praying. And this is one that I had come across over the years, Acts, A-C-T-S. We're not specifically speaking about the, books in, the book in the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, but an acronym. And here's what the A, the C, the T, and the S stand for. So here's just a general, like this is not, you don't have to follow this order exactly every time, but it, it helps us, I think, just as a start. Acts, A, adoration. Just tell God how much you love him. Talk about how much you love him. Because somebody who loves you with all of his heart wants to talk to you. I mean, if you remember maybe back in your time when you were dating or before you'd met your spouse and like, you know, you would like call and, hey, what's going on? And how are you? And what are you doing? And that's cool. What are you thinking? What are you thinking now? What are you thinking now? What did you do today? I know you already told me, but I want to hear it again. Love does an amazing thing. And you just want to hang out with the person. You just want to spend time. It doesn't really matter what it is. You just enjoy being with them. That's what God wants from us. He loves us that way. Hey, what are you doing? I know what you're doing, but I want, you, I want to hear you tell me. How do you feel? I know how you feel, but I want to hear you tell me. I want the conversation. Conversation is so important. Could you imagine? I mean, we do live in more of a society now where it's just, because of, because of these tools that can be overused and, and misused, I mean, if you're sitting next to somebody, don't text them. They're right there. Turn your, it, this, this is amazing. It pivots. It's just so cool. Like you can, and, and it's just amazing how you can, you can actually look at somebody and you can talk to them. 
And the cool thing about that over texting, I just honestly think texting is an inferior form of communication when somebody's right there because you can't get emotion as well as looking at somebody. Because you know when you've said something, some, something to somebody and you've lost them, and they're like, you know, that little crinkle happens in their eyebrow because you're actually looking at them as you talk to them. And so then you can modify what you're saying so that you can help them understand. You can tell when you've offended somebody almost immediately <laughs> if you're talking to them to their face and they're going, what? oh, sorry, did I just, uh, here's what I mean. You can rephrase something. Well, there's nothing more effective in our communication with the Lord than prayer. So I was like, just talk to me. Well, God, what if I misspeak? I know your heart. I'll work out those details, but I want to spend time with you. Spend time with me. Adoration. C, confession. Admit who you really are. God, I admit I'm a sinner. I, I messed up. My heart is wrong. I struggle. God, forgive me. Confess. You don't want to come to God and be like, God, you know, I'm doing really good. I want to come to you about a bunch of messed up people in my life. Uh, but I, however, am not messed up. I am superior than them, and I am doing really great. Bad way. Bad way to start prayer. Come before God yourself and going, Lord, Far be it from me to be somebody that, that thinks I've got it all figured out. God, you know me. You even know me today. You know what I've done. You know my heart. God, forgive me. T, thanksgiving. Talk to God about how thankful you are. I mean, we've got a sign in the hallway that says thankful. And yeah, I mean, it's about that time because we're getting to October and November and Thanksgiving. No, no. We don't reserve being thankful to one time of the year. We are thankful to the Lord and we should be all the time. How much he does for us. How much he does for us. Lord, thank you I didn't fall off the roof. Thank you, Lord. Not that I was afraid that I was going to, but thank you that that didn't happen. Thank you that we get to fellowship tonight, Lord. Thank you, God, that you're working, even in the midst of an election coming up and a pandemic and all the other stuff. God, thank you that you're still on your throne. God, thank you. And it's funny because once you start thanking God for things, it's kind of like this snowball that just keeps building because then you realize, oh, I'm also thankful for this and I'm thankful for this. And you start to get into practice, and thankfulness starts to become a habit. And it's a good habit to be thankful to the Lord. And then the S in Acts, supplication. I don't know. I don't use that word. What does that mean? <laughs> Make a request of the Lord. Oh, and I thought prayer was just supplication. I thought, I thought the acronym for prayer that I use is S, 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 and S. And S, and S, and S, and S, and S. Supplication. I just ask, and I 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 ask. That, imagine, okay, let's put that in a human relationship. You, cu you meet somebody and you just know them. Why? Because they are just the S person. And what I mean by that is they're going to ask you for something. Hey, how are you? you go to them. Hey, how are you doing? So Jim, listen, I need something. <laughs> okay. What's up? Well, here's what I need. All right, sure. I'll see what I can do with that. Cool. So how are you doing? Hey, I'll see you now. Bye. Okay. Next time I see him, hey, how you doing? Hey, Jim, really, I, um, I don't, hey, hi, hi, oh, pleasantries, all that stuff, hi, good, great. Listen, I need something. Okay. And then that gets repeated again and again and again and again. It doesn't mean that I don't love that person, but it's a bit wearying when the person only is looking to you to get something from you. We don't want our prayers to just be supplication where, and I think sometimes, especially as a, as, a, as a young Christian, it's easy to think of prayer as, well, God's my genie and I just ask him for stuff. That's what prayer is. Imagine any relationship where it's just you asking them for stuff. That's not going to be a really healthy or strong relationship. And so that's why we look at these other areas. And that's why the asking comes at the very end. It's like, it's not something that needs to necessarily be at the top. Again, this is just a general guide. If you end up asking the Lord first and go, oh God, I forgot to be thankful. That's fine. He knows your heart, right? But we should be mindful of, of the, what we do. And I really like this, and I try to remember this when I pray, not perfectly, but it just helps me out for sure. You know, um, the, the Lord's Prayer, you know, for some people, we talked about this Sunday, you got to be careful about those things that you just repeat. Those things that you just repeat without thinking about it. Because doing that, is not really prayer either. Not if your mind isn't engaged and if your heart's not engaged. That's just you repeating something. I, I think I used the word yammering on Sunday. I don't ever use the word yammering. But it, it's appropriate. Yammering. Yeah, it kind of sounds like that. Your mouth's just using or muttering or stuttering or whatever. Like you're just, you're saying words. Sound is coming out of your mouth, but you don't have any heart or meaning behind what you're saying. That's dangerous. And here's the other thing. It's insincere. 
I mean, if somebody was doing that to you, and you just knew they were just talking or reading something, like they were like, hey, Jim, and then they just started reading off a piece of paper real quick, never looked at me. I'm going, what, what, what are, you, are you talking to me? Or are you, what are you doing right now? Well, I, I say my prayers before I go to bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before, that's a pretty scary prayer, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, like, that's, I mean, okay. But we have to be careful about these rote, repetitious prayers. Otherwise, we may disengage our heart and our mind when we're talking to God, in which case, we're not actually praying. And so even the Lord's Prayer, and the cool thing about the Lord's Prayer is this, it's just a model prayer. It's an outline. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus didn't tell his disciples to pray those words. He said, pray like this. In other words, he's like, something like this. Something along these lines, here's a good guideline. He just gave an outline. That's all he was doing. He was saying, this is an outline. You take your own words and put it in there. If you wouldn't use certain words like trespass against you, God, I'd never use the word trespass. God, help me not sin against you. Help me not fall. Use your own words. He doesn't want to hear some old old King James version, which isn't you. He wants to hear you. He wants to hear your heart. So the Lord's Prayer is not meant to be prayed word for word, although if you do, it's not like it's a sin. You just have to mean what you're saying. But better yet, use the Lord's Prayer as a model. And use your own words in there and talk to the Lord. So um, this personal time of prayer, it happens when you realize that you're talking to somebody that you love. So has prayer always been necessary? Has prayer always been necessary? It's an interesting question. Always been necessary? Well, I could tell you, I could tell you this. Today, it's necessary, yes. Yesterday, it was definitely necessary. Tomorrow, oh yeah, it's going to be necessary. But has it always been necessary? And the answer, it's, 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 it's kind of a... It's a yes or no question. It's a yes or no answer here. Has it always been necessary? Well, communication with God has always been necessary, but it happened in a different form early on. Because in the garden, it wasn't like Adam and Eve were like, and then they put their hands together and they bowed and they said, Lord, I just, hey, oh, hi, there you are. Why? Because he was with them. It wasn't, oh, I need to speak to you as if you're not with me. God walked with them in the garden. So did they have prayer or communication with the Lord, personal conversation? Yeah, they did. And it was amazing. But then sin enters the world, and when sin comes in, it affects prayer. It affects this communication that we have with the Lord, and it puts, there's there's a, sin causes a barrier to be put in there. And so since the time of sin entering the world in the garden, the necessity of the way that we pray now because, I mean, I'm not physically seeing the Lord, and God is not physically walking with me, but spiritually, yeah, he sure is. And you know what's really cool? Here's the thing. There's a time coming, Christian, where you are going to walk and talk with the Lord like Adam and Eve did in the garden. You're not going to be like, Lord, I, Jim? Oh, hi. Hey, Jim, let's take a walk. I, yes! Let's walk and let's talk. Let's have a conversation. It's going to be like that again. But in the in-between time, between the garden and its perfection before sin and us being with Jesus, there's the time that we live in now. And as we pray, it's the presence of God that comes in. Even though he's not physically here with us, physically, his spirit is with us. His Holy Spirit lives within us as Christians. But man, sin breaks the communication. It causes static. It causes a, you know, I can't, I'm not getting a good signal. It happens. And that's sin that does that. But God loves his children, so God gives them the gift of prayer, and it reopens the lines of communication. Because God does want to talk with us. Um, so when did like this prayer or people calling out to God, at least like in a larger group, when do we first see people calling out to God in the Bible? Well, it's in Genesis chapter 4. Look at this on the screen. Genesis 4, verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and they called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. This is after Cain killed his brother Abel. So Adam and Eve have another child. His name is Seth. And then to Seth was a son born, and his name was Enosh. And then look at this. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Which makes me just go, are you telling me that before that time, in general, people didn't call upon the Lord, and they didn't realize how much they needed the Lord? very interesting. I mean, it's, it's the first time we see in the Bible that people begin to call on God's name. Let's not us delay that. Like, let's not wait until we've tried things first. Hey, you know what, God? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to actually pray to you in a moment. Let me just try my plan first. 
hey, God, I've got something that I'm doing right now, so I'm just going to, I don't need, I don't want to bother you with it. It's too small of a thing. I'm just going to just do this without praying, and if I really need your help, then I'll ask you for prayer. You and I don't have time not to pray. Pray first. Even before you get your mind thinking, my dear overthinkers, <laughs> even before you get your mind spun up and then you've got yourself all in a, in a tizzy, pray first. Pray first. God wants to talk to you. So, does God answer prayer? Hmm. Yes, he does. John 15, verse 7. Jesus said this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that means rest in you, the words that he has in the scriptures, whatever, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Hold on, that looks like a genie in the bottle. Like, the only thing it's missing is ask me your three wishes and it'll be done for you. But other than that, it's almost like what he's saying is that like, Aladdin genie kind of a thing, except it's not because the very first part of that verse says, if you abide in me. In other words, if you are close with me and my words, my words are in you, then ask away. Here's why, because if God's word is in you, then you're not going to ask something that's out of God's character and out of, you're not going to ask for something sinful because you know his words and his words live in you. And so Jesus is saying, hey, yeah, pray according to the scriptures. You want a guarantee to your prayers being answered? Pray according to God's word. Pray according to God's word, and God will answer your prayer. Because you're not going to be praying for something selfish. You're not going to be praying for something with wrong motivations. You're going to go, Lord, I read your word, and that moves me to pray for something. And so I'm going to pray to you, God. I'm going to talk to you because I saw something in your word that stirred me up. So I want to talk to you about that, Lord. You're free to pray about that. And here's the thing. Don't be surprised. When God answers and works in and through your prayer. So pray through the word of God. This is not telling you, hey, I'm just going to ask whatever I want. That's not what that's saying. And, and that verse can be misunderstood for that. Um, Jesus himself prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. And, and Sunday, there was an image that we had used, and it was a picture of Jesus um, praying in the garden. It was a piece of artwork that was done of Jesus as he was there praying in the garden. And thank you, Don, for putting that up there. And so like that right there, Jesus prayed. Well, Jesus is God. Why, does, why is Jesus praying? Because Jesus, the Son, is communicating with the Father. And Jesus is giving us the example in prayer as well, that we should pray. If our Savior prays, then we should pray too. Dr. Luke wrote about this when he heard about everything that happened with Jesus. He heard the firsthand accounts, and he wrote this in Luke 22, verse 41 and 42. And he, Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I put in my request. Hey, when you're praying, you can put in your request. But at the end of your prayer, at least in your heart, make sure that you're going, but at the end of it, God, you'd pick. I put in my request. I think this is the right decision. I think this would be the best thing. But you know what? I'm just a human being. So at the end of it, God, take my prayer and your will be done. And as Jesus prayed this, God's will was that Jesus would suffer the cross and that he would deal with the full wrath of God for me and for you. Sometimes when we hear what God's will is as we pray, <laughs> sometimes we don't pray because we don't actually want to hear God's will. We want what we want to go. We want our will to happen. So what we do is we don't pray. We just go, yeah, I, I, I thought about it a lot and I just did it. Why didn't you pray? I have to tell you, there's times, honestly, I didn't, there's times where I don't pray or I haven't prayed in the past because I had a feel, I knew what God wanted and I didn't want what God wanted, so I just went for it myself and then suffered the consequences. I'm sure that's familiar to you as well. I'm sure you've also experienced that as well. So if that Lord's Prayer that we talked about where he told his disciples how to pray, which gets, it gets titled or subtitled as the Lord's Prayer, that's not actually the Lord's Prayer. That's Jesus teaching his disciples an outline on how to pray. But if we want to look at a Lord's Prayer, like Jesus speaking to the Father, John gives us insight. It's such a personal conversation between Jesus, the Son, and God the Father. And it's in John 17. So if you have your Bibles in John 17, we're going to read a couple verses here. I may skip around just a little bit here, but let's read this section here. This is what I would consider the Lord's Prayer, Jesus praying. Verse 1, John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. 
And this is eternal life, that they know that you are the true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. All right, just stop right there. Jesus is talking to his dad and just going, Father, I'm coming to you because it's time for me to be glorified. Jesus is showing his reliance and all that he's done and how he is doing it under the power of God. And he is in communication with God. How can you and I go forward in our lives without prayer when Jesus, our Savior, went through prayer and experienced prayer and was prayed to the Father before he endured his cross? How can we go through things without praying? We can't. We shouldn't do that. And yet we can do it. I thought this about the garden. If you were here Sunday's message, it was Jesus going into the garden of the Gethsemane. There's things that strike me each time I teach the word and certain things that I notice that I maybe didn't notice before. But it just, you know, it struck me this time when I was teaching it that Jesus, he came out after praying the first time and he saw the disciples sleeping. He said, you know, now's not the time to be asleep, be awake. And then you know what Jesus did? He wasn't like, well, guys, I prayed my one time, I'm good. The weight of the cross and the horror of the wrath of God was so overwhelming, Jesus said, I'm not ready yet to go. I got to pray some more. Well, stuff's happening, Jesus. Like, we got to keep going on the timetable. Jesus is like, I don't have time not to pray. I got to go back in. I've got to go back into the Garden of Sorrow. I've got to go back. And, and you know what Jesus did? It said three times he went to his father, to, the, to, his, to God the Father, and he cried out, Daddy, if it's your will, let your will be done. But my request is that this cup, this terrible, overwhelming cup would be taken from me. And God gave Jesus an answer and he came out, and then as he came out, okay, all it took was praying once. He came out, and Jesus was, no, I got to make another request. Went back in. Came out, had to make another request. Went back in a third time. This shows that for you and I, we need to be persistent in prayer. I've been praying about this thing for, you know, a week or two. Keep going. Because sometimes prayers last years. Sometimes prayers last decades. Yeah, I wasn't going to plan to say this, but yeah, my mom has been praying for her neighbor who has been an absolute terror to her in New York. And some of you know the story because I've shared little bits and pieces, but generally speaking, like this woman, like a cult, like a cultic shrine in her basement, like spiritual darkness. Um, and for my mom, like we got to have prayer meetings at this house, at our house. We have to do something because there's some deep spiritual darkness happening right next door. And, you know, there's things where God's doing a good work here at the Telios Christian Fellowship, and he has for the last 10 years for, for certain. But sometimes if the enemy doesn't, you know, if he, if he attacks me he, and it's not effective, then he's going to attack my family. He's going to attack my wife. He's going to attack my kids. And I just, every time my mom was getting attacked, I'm like, that's because she absolutely supports our church. She is a prayer warrior. She loves, even though she hasn't met any of you, she loves you. And so as she's praying and as she's lifting up and she's, she's recruiting other Christians there in New York to be praying for our fellowship and for Humboldt County, you think the enemy doesn't, like, hate that? I mean, hate with a capital H? So the enemy's going to use people and circumstances to try to discourage my mom. And there's definitely been moments over the last couple of years where she's just been like, but I just have to tell you. Like, she'll call me and be like, that neighbor, I'm just so, oh, like she just needs to vent. But then you know what my mom does because my mom loves the Lord and because God's given her a heart after him? She always comes back around at the end of the conversation. She's like, well, I just need to pray. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't understand how it's all going <sighs> to, but I know this. God's good. I'm just going to keep praying. There you go, mom. Keep going. And I would hear that same repeated struggle, and then she always turns a corner at the end for year after year after year after year, probably for the last six, seven, eight years. It's been a long time. And a breakthrough happened in the last, when did I go visit her? Like three, four months ago. Um, shortly after that, it has nothing to do with me visiting her. I just, but like when I was there, the situation still hadn't changed. Except something seemed to be changing. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but we just kept praying. And then a couple weeks after I'd come back, she's like, I don't know what's up with our neighbor, but she's like being super nice. Like it's weird. Like she was calling the city on us and she was like, it was, she was doing horrible things over years and years, making things miserable for my mom and all the other neighbors. It's like, something's different. He goes, you know what? In my prayer group at the church, as we were praying for her, they told me, like one of them, the Lord spoke to one of their hearts and said, God's going to get a hold of her and God's going to do a change in her heart. You just continue to be faithful. So even though my mom didn't have that, here's the cool thing about praying and praying together as a body is when you're down, somebody else 
can be given the encouragement that you need, and they can speak right into your life. And so, yeah, the neighbor lady just like coming over, having conversations with my mom. My mom's like, okay. And she's just like, you know what? I'm not, I, I don't want to play the fool per se or be gullible, but she goes, I feel like something has happened to her. I feel like something spiritually has changed in her. And then my mom was like, yep, see, God, God's good. Like, God does what he's going to do. And she's just preaching. I was just, you know, hold the phone a little bit away and let her talk. Because she's just super excited. And I'm like, yeah, God's good. And she's just like on cloud nine, you know. But that was a prayer for like years. You may have a prayer for decades. I just want to encourage you, continue to pray. Don't, don't get discouraged. And if you're discouraged, here's what you do. You go talk to other Christians about how you're discouraged and let them encourage you. Like, let them encourage you. Let them talk to you. Let them give you hope. Because you... You're not called to be a, a Christian where you're all on your island by yourself. That's not how it works. We need each other. We absolutely do need each other. I'm not going to read all of John 17. There's so much in John 17. In fact, all of John 17 is a prayer um, that Jesus has to the Father. And the cool thing is that he talks about you and me in this prayer. He loves you and I so much that he talks about those that will come to know him in the future. And he talks about how he loves those that are going to come to know him in the future and how they're his, and no one can take them away. You want to know what Jesus thinks about you? Read John 17 sometime. It's, it's his prayer to God, and you get to eavesdrop and listen to how he brings you up and how much he loves you. Prayer is so powerful, but, you know, the enemy, <laughs> he wants to discourage you from praying. Like, if he could do anything, like, if you want to be distracted, just try to start praying. Just open the Bible and be like, all right, I'm going to just read. What is going on right now? Buzz, buzz. What? Urgent? What? All I did was, hold on, buzz, buzz, hold on, buzz, buzz. Maybe for you it's like, Mom, I need help. What is going on right now? Lord, I just thank you. Jim, really? Yeah, really. Here's why. Prayer could be, if you want to like relate prayer in one word, I, I think of it this way, warfare. That's what prayer is. It's warfare. If you choose to pray, you are engaging in warfare. You have picked a side and the enemy hates you for it, and he's going to try to do anything he can to discourage you from praying. So at times, like when I pray, when I read the word, it's almost comical. When something comes up, it's like, really? Are you kidding? Now? Now. This is the moment where that happens? Come on. And then you start to go, of course this is when it's going to happen. And I just encourage you, don't be discouraged by the stuff that comes up when you pray. You just keep praying. You don't stop praying. I mean, you may have to pause to deal with some issue, but then make sure you come right back and pray. And deal with the issue and pray. You can do both. It's okay. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. Here's a hymn. This is by a guy named William Cowper from 1779. And so the language is a little bit old-timey, but I think you'll get it here. The, so the hymn is, What Various Hindrances We Meet. Translation, oh, wow, what many troubles we come across. And here's the first three lines of this. What various hindrances we meet in coming to the mercy seat. Like you come to pray and all of a sudden all these challenges hit you. Yet who that knows the worth of prayer but wishes to be more often there? Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw. Gives exercise to faith and love. Brings every blessing from above. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. In other words, when we stop praying, we stop fighting. That's bad. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright. I love these last two lines here. And Satan trembles when he sees the wicked saint upon his knees. Satan is freaked out when even the youngest Christian, the newest convert to Christianity, just goes, I think I need to pray right now. No, 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 stop! Because when you pray, you bring all of heaven against Satan. You bring all of heaven against Satan. And he feels it. And he hates it. That's why you pray. You pray against the things that you see in your family. You pray because, honestly, the thing behind it is not a physical issue. It's a spiritual issue. For our nation, oh, we just need some more rules or laws, or we just need the right people elected. <laughs> We've been doing this for a couple hundred years. Like, that's not the answer. You know what we need? It's a spiritual battle for our nation. We need prayer. we got to pray. You think about your family and the things that come. I mean, even if you're not, if you're not, if you're not a Christian, don't be surprised if non-Christians, I mean, if you are a Christian, don't be surprised if the non-Christians in your family come against you. I want to encourage you, don't take it personally against them. 
the enemy is stirring them up and agitating them. Why? Because you are reigning all of heaven against the enemy, and he's feeling it. Oh, and by the way, he's losing, and he knows it. He knows that he lost. So think about this. Satan is a person, he's a loser, and I mean that in the truest form of the word. He's lost. When did he lose? On the cross. So he's a loser that's a sore loser. That in, He knows that when the sun is set today, this is one less day that he has. He's so mad. He's mad at God, and he's mad at anybody that loves God. So when you call out and go, hey, God, I'd like to talk to you, he hears it, and he hates it. You don't stop. You keep going. You don't stop. You keep praying. And when you pray, you got to make sure when you pray, and you're a- especially if you're praying and it's, it's you asking God for something or an answer, a yes or a no or this or that, please, please, please make sure that you and your heart are ready for God to give whatever answer he wants to give. Again, make your request, but at the end of your prayer, make sure that you're ready for whatever God wants, because right, whatever God picks is the, right, is the right answer. Let him, let him do what he's going to do. Don't fight him. And when God says no to you and you wish he said yes, don't get so offended. Because prayer is not, God, I'm praying to you so that you'll do what I want. Prayer is, God, I love you. You're so good to me. I, I, I'm so thankful for this conversation. And Lord, here's what I wish would happen. I really wish this, but God, you decide. Make sure that you understand that God may give you the answer you don't want to hear. But when he gives you the answer, it's always the right answer. And you don't have to understand it. You just have to know the person who gave you the answer. Paul tells us this about our prayer, ways to think about prayer. In Ephesians, he's talking to the, the church in Ephesus, and he says this in Ephesians 6, 18 and 19, praying at all times in the Spirit, not in your flesh, but you go, God, guide my prayers by your Holy Spirit. Show me how to pray, what to pray about. Praying at all times, not just sometimes, all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, so you can ask God for things. That's fine. Just don't make that the only thing. To that end, keep alert. Wait, when I'm praying, I got to keep alert? Yeah, because attack will come. The enemy hates it. Keep alert with all perseverance. I got to keep praying about some things for even longer than I want to, for days and months and even years? Yes, with perseverance, pray. I prayed for it for like five minutes. God didn't do it. God's not real. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow, are you going to have a tantrum now? Are you going to cry on the floor? Is that what you're going to do now? Because God didn't answer you the way you wanted in your five-minute prayer? Ah, <sighs> Grow a spiritual spine <laughs> and go back to God. And the spine that we grow with the Lord is a spine that's arched. Why? Because we're humbling ourselves before him. It's not a proud spine that's straight up. The Christian spine is the one, when we come before the Lord, we bow it before the Lord. And we go, Lord, I defer my will to your will. It goes against the type of uh, attitude the world says you should have. The world's like, you tell people what's what. God's like, come before me humbly. I have all the answers, but you have to come to me in the right attitude. So with all perseverance, make supplications for just yourself. Nope. Look at that. For all the saints. Wait, when I'm praying, I got to think about other people too? (laughs) Yes, you do. Otherwise, you become a selfish, self-centered person. Because your life revolves all around you, which it doesn't. And so Paul tells the church here, hey, you got to be persevering in your prayer, and don't forget, you should be praying for other people. Well, okay, so just the people that I like? No, it says all the saints. That means there's some believers you don't like so much, you pray for them. I would encourage you, pray especially for them. All right, I'll pray that they think, they, they come, they, they see things my way. No. <laughs> pray that your heart would be soft towards them. And pray that the Lord would do what he wants to do in their heart and in your heart towards them. It's so important for us to pray for one another. I'm so thankful for the people that pray for me as a pastor. And they're like, hey, pastor, we pray for you. Like every Saturday, we're praying for you. I'm like, that's when the attack is hitting hard. It's Saturday during the whole day. Not so much on Sunday. Saturday is really the big day. And so I, I'll take, I will absolutely solicit any prayers from people on Saturday because the enemy's just like, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to teach tomorrow. You're not going to say that. You're not going to do that. And there's some really intense spiritual battle that happens. And sometimes it's not against me. It's against my family or my mom will call or something happens, you know, with Don and I, we have an argument or I know you never think that happens, but, you know, we have an argument or, you know, with our kids, something just happens. And you're just like, what? Of course, it's Saturday. Of course, it's going to happen right now. If you need prayer, you should solicit and ask for prayers from other Christians too. Hey, 
It's going to be a challenging week. I've got some things coming up. Hey, could you pray for me this week? That's why we got those uh, prayer requests and praise forms. D- don't feel like I don't want to let people know what's going on. Listen, here's the amazing shock for you. We know you're messed up. We already get it. We already get it. We know it. Like, when nobody is under any illusion that you are perfect or you have it all together. You may have it in appearances, but we're all falling apart in some way, okay? That's why it's not shocking when we go, hey, I need prayer for this. You got it. Well, let's do it. Let's pray. It's important for us to do that. Humble yourself to receive prayer from other people. Don't be a proud Christian where it's like, I don't want people to know what's going on. Why? You think they'll be shocked to find out you're messed up? Because <laughs> it's not a shock. It's not. Humble yourself. Don't let pride get in the way from allowing people to pray for you. Also, this pastor would like to make a request. We're going to make a slight change in the hmm, weeks, months to come in, when it comes to prayer. So Sunday morning, like, I'll teach. Uh, usually I'll be the one teaching. And then, uh, you know, it's like, hey, if you'd like some prayer, there'll be a few of us to pray. But the reality is I could always, we could always use more people that are willing to pray with others. And here's what I'm going to do. Because I believe in this season of our church, it's important for me to meet the newer people that are coming to our church. There are people that have come to our church for like, four weeks. I've never met them before. Why? Because I'm out there praying, which I don't mind. Don't get me wrong here, but I'm praying with someone, and I look over, and I see that uh, somebody. I'm going, I haven't said hi to them yet. Like, they've been coming for a month. I should go over and say hi, but I can't, because right now I'm praying with this person. I'm thinking, wait, I can have anyone pray with this person, but I need to go over and say hi to those folks that are newer, at least for the the season that we find ourselves, because there's a lot of people coming to our church, and it means I'm just a person, but I think it means a lot if the pastor comes over and just says hi like acknowledges that, hi, I have noticed you've been coming to the church. I don't know your name, and I would like to know your name. But what does that require? That requires other people to carry the load in different areas. And so my encouragement is for you to be praying about maybe the possibility of you being that kind of a person. Or if you're a couple, to be a couple that does that as well. They would just be there willing to pray with people. Well, I'm not really that good at prayer. You know how you get good at prayer? By praying. <laughs> it's called practice. It works. It's really great. I noticed this with my senior pastor uh, when I was an assistant pastor, and I was assistant pastor for like 14 years. He would be done teaching, and then the pastors would come up the way we had it there in Arizona. The pastors would come up to the stage or wherever we were, and we'd just be available for people to come up and pray. And then the senior pastor would also come and, you know, kind of join all of us. And you know, like, you know where 80% of the people that came up to pray, where they would go? To the senior pastor, the guy that just spent 40 to 50 minutes just teaching. Because he's got the more direct line to, baloney, he doesn't. Every other one of these people, actually, every other one of the Christians in, that are sitting in the sanctuary also have the exact same ability to pray with you. And I think we just need to break some of these like false pictures where it's like, I gotta go talk to the pastor because that's gonna be more effective. No, not necessarily. So I just want to encourage you, like, um, if you need prayer and if I'm not available for prayer, please don't take offense at that. It's, it's nothing personal. It is totally nothing personal. Sometimes, sometimes it, I'm just like mentally and physically, I'm just drained after second service. And I'll smile and I'll absolutely listen. And sometimes folks just, they just want to talk because they just want to share this something that's heavy on them. And I'll definitely do that. But I kind of go, as I see other people going off to their cars and driving off, I'm like, they could be helping, right? They could do it. They could... And it's fine. I'm not, I, I just, you know, I'm not angry or upset, but I just know that God's got, he wants to involve more people in prayer, praying with people. It's such an important thing. So as I'm saying all these things, don't feel guilted. That's not it. Unless the Lord's speaking to your heart, in which case, then yeah, conviction is what it is, right? Also, if you're also already doing something at the church, God's not asking you to do this. He's not asking a few people to do a lot of things. He's asking everybody to do something. That, that makes the church go really smooth. Okay, so I'm a, I just went on a, t- a super big tangent there. Let me pick up the speed here, and as, I, as we close off here, um, what's going to hinder your prayers? Are there things that could, could get in the way of your prayers being effective? Yes, here's the general thing. Generally speaking, the thing that's going to get in the way of you and your prayers to God, this conversation, sin. Generally speaking, sin is going to get in the way every time of your prayers. But most specifically, here's some ways that sin can show up when it comes to praying. Selfish prayers. In other words, these are prayers where you're just asking for yourself. Like, if you actually listen to yourself, your prayers primarily focus on you and what you want and what you need and what, how God can help you. And here's what the Bible tells us about those kind of prayers. James 4, verse 3. 
He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your, your passions. In other words, you're just praying for yourself. You don't ever think about anybody else when you come talk to God. So that's why for some people, their prayers seem ineffective. It's because they're only talking about themselves. So remember, we want to pray for all saints and all people for that matter, not just believers, but unbelievers as well. And so when you go to God, the first thing you should think about is not your will, but his will. We already talked about that. But here's the other thing. Sometimes we, um, we get so self-focused. Paul tells the Philippian church this. Here's another verse, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Wow. So when you come to prayer, you need to think about other people more significantly than yourself. You are not the number one person when you come to prayer. Who's number one? Well, God, of course. Well, then I come second? No, everybody else comes before you. Ooh. Ah. Remember, the Christian's spine is bowed before the Lord, and we're going, Lord, I'm here to lift other people up. And, and yes, I do want to pray for myself, but I don't want to forget other people. I don't want to be so self-centered. And it says, verse 4, Philippians 2, let each of you look not on your own interests, not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Think about other people. What do other people need? What have they been praying for? What have you, what, what's on your heart when you think about other people? Lift them up. Even if they haven't asked for it, just pray for them. Here's something else that could be a hindrance to you in prayer, unforgiveness. If you aren't forgiving to other people, don't be surprised if you don't sense the forgiveness of God in your life. I mean, God himself saying, if you don't forgive others, I will not forgive you. Like, if you're holding some deep-seated unforgiveness, oh, I'm so mad at what they did for me 15 years ago. It's not to say that they didn't hurt you and it wasn't real. That's not what we're talking about. But what we're saying is, what gives you the right to hold something against them when God took away so much more from you? I mean, so spiritually speaking, it's like that person ripped me off for like $50 spiritually speaking. And wait, how, how are you not forgiving them for that when you have been forgiven of $50 billion of what you did against God, spiritually speaking? How in the world are you still holding this against anybody when God forgave you of everything? Unforgiveness will absolutely stumble the effectiveness of your conversation with God. You've got to ask God for, for, to, for, to give you the heart of forgiveness, and then you forgive. It, and once you do, here's the amazing thing. It opens up your prayer life. You're suddenly free. You can pray. You experience the forgiveness of God. Here's something else. Um, if you start to doubt or not believe that God can do what God can do. God, I want to pray that you'd save my, oh, family members. You know, but it's been decades. I mean, they were raised this way. They don't know you. And I mean, odds are, we start to talk certain ways. Odds are they probably never will change. Do you see what you're doing right there? Wow, you, you're basically, you're preparing yourself to be disappointed if God doesn't answer your prayer. So what are you doing? You're not actually asking God. You're like, God, this is what I want. But then you start backing up and going, but I'm not really, I don't want to ask for that because it's not realistic and it's probably not going to happen anyway. And you know, it's probably not going to happen. So I don't know, God, I'm sorry I even came to you. James says this in James 1, verse 6 and 7. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. I mean, if you're doubting who God is, remember, it doesn't mean God's going to answer the prayer the way you want, but this is what you have. You go to God with confidence going, God is going to answer this prayer the right way, and I know he is. He is that kind of a God. He has that much power, and I have faith in who he is, and so I come boldly and pray to you. As opposed to going, I don't know, God, maybe you do, maybe you won't, maybe you... It's like one of those buoys out in the ocean there, except it's not tethered to anything. It's just being tossed. That's what a that's what James says a Christian is like who doubts that God can answer prayers. You don't want to be that person. Here's something else. If there's a discord at home, if there's um, conflict at home, that is going to be a re that's going to definitely have an effect on your prayer life. Specifically, husbands. Um, if your attitude, husbands, towards your wife is less than godly, don't be surprised if your prayers seem to be ineffective. I didn't make it up. Peter actually talks about this. 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And you need to pray for that to be possible because you can't do it in your own strength. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers, look at that, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Love your wives, treat her with respect. Love your wife. You just have one, one wife. You know what I mean, all right? Love your wife. 
uh, treat her with honor. Uh, otherwise, don't be surprised if your prayers aren't hindered. Wow, that's pretty. So then wives just get away with, n- no, no. Ephesians 5, through 24, after God's done working over the guys, it says this, you know, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. This doesn't mean that your husband has all the right answers. And sometimes it, what it means is God is just saying in the hierarchy, here's where the buck stops. Spiritually, I'm going to talk to the husband about what's going on in the family. And the husband can't be like, but God, it's the wife. God's like, shut your mouth. You are the head. I put you in this position. You are responsible for the spiritual health of your family. So let's you and I have a conversation. So that's what it is. At which point the wife should be going, yeah, you know, I kind of like that arrangement. That's, that's pretty cool how that all works. It doesn't mean you don't give input to your husband and you aren't part of the decision-making process. It just talks about that God absolutely honors that respect. And so we want our prayers to be effective. So if you have some of these hindrances, some of the ones, these are not all of them. These are not all the hindrances that, that, that can get in the way of prayer. Let's say you have one of the things on the list there or there's other things that you feel are getting in the way. Some type of sin is getting in the way. How do you fix that, that thing that's blocking your prayers? The Bible gives us an answer for that as well. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us for all, our righteous, all unrighteousness. The roadblock is cleared, the road is repaved, the lights are turned on, and it's like, ah. Oh. If you pray with this sin in your life, you have a lifestyle of sin, some habitual, repeated thing, and you're just, and it's not that you are grieved by it, it's that you're doing nothing about it. And you're just like, I know that's there, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, that's going to get in the way of your prayers. Ask God to forgive you your sins. Mean it from your heart. And then don't be surprised when God opens up these doors of prayer where all of a sudden you feel your relationship with God so much closer because this sin is being moved out of the way. It's been forgiven. Okay, it's so important. So why is prayer important to our church, very specifically? Why is prayer important to the Telios Christian Fellowship? Here's why. Because I believe it's the engine that actually keeps things going here. I mean, you look at it, it's a... A modest building, a tiny building, all things considered. We have all the parking in the world on a Sunday, but we have a small building. Most churches have the opposite issue. They have a big enough building, but they don't have enough parking. We have a reversed issue. It's kind of like, okay. So on Sundays, we have people that are coming in, even under COVID. There are so many more people that have been coming to our church. You know what that tells me is that what we are doing is necessary and needed, especially in the day and the age that we live in. We don't need less church, we need more church. And the other thing that gets me too is, there's like 20 plus kids that are coming as well. Is it important that children also learn about the Lord during times like this? Absolutely, yes. They need to learn from even a young age. It's like, well, there's stuff going on, so we're not, you know, I'm not going to go seek the Lord. This doesn't mean those that aren't coming to church aren't seeking the Lord. I just mean generally speaking, like, I'm going to put my faith on hold. No, they have chosen to. Their parents have chosen to bring them, and they are learning, hey, listen, it's okay to come. It's okay to be a part of it. I think those are important lessons. Prayer is so important because those kids are being taught that prayer is important. We're being taught in our sanctuary. We pray a lot. We do pray a lot because it's the engine that keeps things going. Um, I want to show you the picture of the outside of a church. It's actually a, a drawing of the outside of a church. So here we go. Yeah, right? I, I mean, basically, that's our church. It looks just like that, right? Tell you, Christian Fe- columns, all that stuff. Yeah. In my, in my mind, that's no, no, no. But no, that's a church. That's a, a church, um, and uh, it's a church in London. And there were five young college students that were spending a Sunday in London. They were visiting. And so they wanted to hear the famed preacher, C, uh, Charles H. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, preach. And he preached in this church. This was the church, one of the churches he preached in in his lifetime, but this was the, the more famous of them. And so they were waiting for the doors to open to the church. They were kind of gathered out front there, and the students were greeted by a man, and the, the guy just right away says, gentlemen, uh, let me show you around. And it's like really nice. Like guy just comes out and goes, here, let me, let me show you around the church there. And um, the inside of the church, another sketch, look at this. I mean, this is basically like Telios Christian Fellowship. Look at the inside here. Uh, yeah, basically that's us, right? Yeah. That's the inside of the church. Is that amazing? Yes, there's definitely, there's definitely some. 
I can tell you the pastor's distance for sure. No, it's really cool because he's teaching from a place that's vertically in the middle of the people. He's kind of at the same height as the middle mezzanine or row there. Then there's the upper deck way up there. And, and keep in mind, this is before amplification. There's no sound system. So he's just preaching. I mean, this guy's preaching for like hours. And people are listening. They're holding on to words because they're so hungry for the word of God. They so, I hope this encourages you. Like, we may live in a world where it's like, does this even really happen? It has happened, and there's nothing stopping this from happening again. And we may be on the cusp of this happening again in our own way and version of it. Because oh, in a world that doesn't give us hope, there's only one source of hope, and that's coming from, from the Lord. And so these people are coming, and they come, these five college students, you know, hey, I want to give you a tour, comes inside, and obviously the people weren't there, so it's empty, but it's just this cavernous space, and they're just so amazed. And their tour guide says, uh, would you like to see the heating plant of the church? Or in other words, would you like to see the boiler room? You know, how we heat up this entire large building. And they were not really interested in coming to visit this church in London so they could go visit the boiler room. And not only that, it was July and it was a super hot day. So the last thing you want to see is where, like, how you heat the building. But they didn't want to offend the guy, right? So they're like, okay. So these five college students follow their tour guide and takes them down to the lower parts of the church there. They go down the stairway, a door is quietly opened, and then their guide was like, shh. He goes, this is our heating plant. This is the power plant of the church. And as he opens the door, he allows them to look in there. Surprised, the student saw 700 people bowed in prayer, seeking a blessing on the service that was soon to begin in the auditorium above. Softly closing the door, the gentleman then introduced himself, the tour guide. It was C.H. Spurgeon, the preacher. Never underestimate prayer. What is the engine that drives this little fellowship right here? It's prayer. Absolutely prayer. Oh no, it's got to be like, I don't know, maybe it's like the artwork, or maybe it's the, the, the unfinished ceiling. That's really, yeah. Uh-uh. If you look on the externals, you're going to miss the actual power of what's, what's working here in this fellowship. It's, what's that? Oh, yeah, it's a sign. Obviously, it's our amazing sign that we have on the front of the building. That's what's drawing all the people. Prayer. 700 people were praying in the boiler room, in the basement of that church for the service that was coming so that God would do a work. They were praying for the people that would be coming, for the unsaved that would be coming so that they would hear the gospel, have their hearts changed, and would receive Christ. Never underestimate prayer. C.H. Spurgeon said this. I'm going to read you a little paragraph here, I, I, and I am on my last page of notes here. But let me read you this paragraph here. It is strange how little we use, it, it is strange how little we make use of the spiritual blessings that God gives us. But it is stranger still how little we make use of God himself. Though he is our own God, we apply ourselves but a little to him, and we ask but a little of him. How seldom do we ask counsel at the hands of the Lord? How often do we go about our own business without seeking his guidance? In our troubles, we constantly strive to bear our burdens by ourselves instead of casting them upon the Lord so that he could carry them. This is not because we may not, for the Lord says, I'm yours. Come and use my resources as you will. You can come freely to my storehouse. If you come more often, you will be welcome more often. How cool is that? God's like, the more you come, the more I'll give you. You just got to come more often. Come ask me. Come seek me. Let's talk more often. It's our own fault if we don't make use of the riches of our church, of, if we don't make use of the riches of our God. And then Spurgeon goes on and he says, you have such a friend and he invites you. Take what you need from him daily. You should never want as long as you have God to go to. Never fear or faint when you have God to help you. Go to your treasure and take what you need. God has everything you need. He says, and he goes on, practice making God your everything. How? By prayer. He will supply you with all, or better still, he can give you even better than all, he'll give you himself. And then Spurgeon says, let me urge you then to make use of God. Make use of him in prayer. Go to him often because he is your God. What a privilege we have to come to the Lord in prayer. We should use God constantly. Go, God, I need you. I need you every hour. So just so you know, for our fellowship, I want to make this clear. 
It's not money and finances that makes this church go. It's not programs that makes this church go. It's not even the people here that make this church go. It's the power of the prayers of the saints. God can use any person. God can use anyone that he chooses to use. He can use any fellowship located in any place he wants. But we need to be faithful as a church to pray. So I pray, I ask this of you, that you would be faithful to pray for our church. Because I believe God wants to do a great work here in Humboldt County. I, pray, I, I, pray that I, I believe that he wants to do something that hasn't been done in a long, long time here. And we are just one small fellowship that God wants to use. What you and I need to be praying is that God does a revival in our community through all the churches. That the churches teach the word of God and direct people to Jesus so that we can see our community change for Jesus. I want my kids to grow up in a community that is different than the one that they ca first came to 10 years ago. And you know what? God is doing a work. So let's be a church of prayer. And in fact, would you agree with me as I close in prayer? And uh, Ben, why don't you come on up and lead us in a closing song here? Mm. Papa, I have just touched on prayer. I have just, I have just scratched the surface with my fingernail. It hasn't even... We haven't even did, uh, dove in so deeply, but that's because we have our whole life and all of eternity to know you more. I pray, though, that in this life we would make the most of knowing you by conversing with you, by fellowshipping with you, by talking to you. I pray that we'd be so thankful when we pray. I pray that we would, we would lift up other people, even ones we don't know, but we see on Sunday mornings, we see at work, we see in our neighborhood. Lord, make us your people of prayer. God, we thank you for the engine of this church, Lord. And as we pray, God, you're doing a work and you're moving. And it's all because of who you are. We give you all honor and all praise and all glory. You get all the credit. God, do things that would blow us away. So we pray by faith, believing that you can do it, that, Lord, you would do a miraculous work here in our fellowship, here in our community, and, Lord, here in our nation how our nation needs you. We lift up all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said.